Welcome, and it's with great pleasure that I open this event organized by ICMA on the role of sustainable bonds in financing the transition. This is, of course, highly topical in the immediate aftermath of this year's Conference of the Parties, the COP26, that ended with the signing of the Glasgow Climate Pact on the 12th of November, 2021. With current emission cuts not being sufficient to even reach the two degree C goal of the Paris Agreement, let alone the aim of, aim of one and a half degree C, the pact sets a challenge for nations to come back next year in Egypt with improved 2030 targets. Assessing progress on nations' climate plans will now be helped by an agreement of new rules on transparency and emissions reporting, as well as standardized emissions reporting practices from 2024. Agreement has also been reached to accelerate efforts towards the phase down of unabated coal power, as well as the phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies and recognition of support for a just transition. This is the first time that fossil fuels have been explicitly included in a UN climate agreement. At ICMA, sustainability is increasingly integral to everything we do, and sustainable finance is one of our four key areas of focus. We are privileged to be the stewards of global standards for green, social, sustainability, and sustainability-linked bonds, collectively referred to as sustainable bonds, that are referenced by more than 95% of international issuance in this segment. These standards have been developed with the input of a wide market initiative of more than 400 organizations and stakeholders under the auspices of the Executive Committee, the Green and Social Bond Principles, supported by ICMA. The principles also provide specific guidance on climate transition finance in a dedicated handbook, which was published in December last year. So today, we have a great opportunity with this event to look at how the sustainable bond market is financing the transition and how it may continue to do so at scale. I would like to thank in advance the moderators and the panelists for what I'm sure will be a very enlightening discussion and stock take. I now have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Jose Sainz Armada, the CFO of Ibadrola. It is a pleasure for me to participate in the International Capital Markets Association event on the importance of sustainable bonds to finance the goals of the Paris Agreement, including transition. No one doubts that the need to promote energy transition to tackle global warming and to make possible a true sustainable development throughout the world. The last special report made by the panel of experts created by United Nations to monitor the evolution of climate change indicates that global emissions need to decrease by at least 45% by 2030 and get to net zero in just 30 years from now. Therefore, we must already think beyond COP26 to deliver the Paris Agreement of limiting the global temperature rise to 1.5% centigrade by the end of the century. Since Paris, civil society is leading the debate, pushing governments. It is amazing to see how much the consensus has increased. While the conference continues to be hugely important for global efforts to step up action to prevent the worst impacts of climate change, we need to focus our minds to drive momentum across governments, the energy sector, financial institutions and wider investment audiences about the action we need to take now to turn net zero ambitions into a reality. At Iberdrola, we are firmly committed to achieving these ambitious targets, which must be measured in every country. It's not only good for the environment and society, but also good for the economy, for business and for our communities. It will bring enormous benefits to reduce emissions and improve air quality and health, to create economic activity and sustainable growth, to transform declining industries in the carbonized industries for the future, like, for example, shipyards uh, to offshore wind. But this transformation will require massive investments and shorter permitting processes in renewable energies, in electricity networks to support the, integ the integration of massive amounts of renewables, improve resiliency and quality of services, and support new uses like heating, cooling, and mobility. In energy storage, pump storage, batteries, and of course, green hydrogen. According to the International Energy Agency, 
four trillion dollars per annum have to be invested in the coming years in clean energy. This means multiplying by three current investment levels. To sum up, the energy transition is the greatest investment opportunity at present. But it requires solid, clear, and stable regulatory policies with a long-term view that also includes ambitious targets. At Iberdrola, we anticipated the energy transition 20 years ago. Today, there is a strong consensus around decarbonization, but at that time, we had to persuade regulators, governments, and other market agents. Since 2000, we have invested almost 120 billion euros in renewables, electricity networks, and storage. As a result, we have transformed Iberdrola from a local Spanish utility with coal, nuclear, and hydropower into a coal-free global leader in energy transition. And we have done it without leaving anybody behind. We are locating and training the workforce. As a good example of what uh, I have just mentioned is that we have launched an open innovation platform focused on just transition in Lada, which is a region of Spain where we closed the last coal facility of the group in collaboration with universities of the Basque country and uh, the Polytechnic of Madrid. Right now, Iberdrola is present in dozens of countries with more than 100 million people served worldwide, more than 30 billion euros investment in renewables, more than 35,000 megawatts of capacity, and around 300 million euros invested per year in R&D. We have, in 2020, emissions already below 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour produced. Storage capacity equivalent to more than 5 million homes and 1,250,000 kilometers of power lines. After two decades of commitment with decarbonization, we are accelerating our investments with the largest plan in our history, both in our current markets, but also in new ones like the Asia Pacific. Almost all these investments will be directed to sustainable activities aligned with the U European Union taxonomy. It will almost double our annual investment of the last years to reach 75 billion by 25. Over 90% of that investment in electricity networks and renewables and 150 billion euros by 2030 that will enable us to achieve 100,000 megawatts of renewables by then and double our net and network assets base by 2030 to reach 60 billion euros. Additional, additionally, to support growth towards decarbonization beyond 2030. We're expanding, as I mentioned, in countries like Japan, Poland, or Sweden to new platforms. And we will and we are building alliances with other industries. We are already working with partnerships with car manufacturers and other industrial partners, both for core technologies as well as for more innovative solutions for the future, like green hydrogen. Because the contribution of all clean technologies is crucial to decarbonize our, our economies. Moving on now to the finances aspects, it is worth mentioning that being able to raise the huge amount of needed funds will require a collective and coordinated action between governments, central banks, private sector, and civil society as a whole. The financial sector plays an essential role in this regard, and new parameters of investments are having a key role. In the past, we did have yield risk and liquidity. Nowadays, we have a fourth one, which is such ability and strategy to be sustainable. In fact, a growing number of public and private financial institutions are putting climate and sustainability at the heart of their operation, shifting support from fossil fuels to clean energy, offering favorable financial conditions in loans to green investments, enforcing companies to report transparently, and incorporating climate risks in their strategies and decision making. In Europe, the European Central Bank is a strongly committed to further incorporate the climate change consideration into its monetary policy framework. The European Commission is gearing up for issuing in green bonds 30% of the 750 billion aid package from the next generation funds. 
The Bank of England has taken on a new mandate to make its monetary policy greener, and as such, climate change being a priority for them. The World Bank and important insurance companies have stopped covering investments in the more polluting activities. I believe this approach is completely needed, as, sustainable, as sustainability is a crucial to provide better returns and value creation in the long term. Companies that best manage risks and opportunities generated by the climate change and provide more information in a more transparent way will be preferred by investors, leading and facilitating massive mobilization from, of capital from sustainable investors. Iberdrola's financial strategy has always been leaded by prudence in terms of solvency ratios and diversification of the different sources of financing, which allow a sustainable growth path. For us, sustainability means a philosophy which is integrated in the whole group. That is why our financing strategy is clearly focused on green and sustainable financing, prioritizing green financing in long-term debt instruments to be consistent with the group's strategy, visions, and values. As such, in terms of transparency, the Verdola has a strong reporting and disclosure system on sustainability risks, being a pioneer in the implementation of the latest recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Moreover, the group's green financial transactions are subject to Iberdrola's framework for green financing, which is aligned with the International Capital Markets Association green bond principles, and only including assets and activities eligible under the European Union tax zone. Use of proceeds, strict reporting, external verification, and strict standards for the eligibility of activities and assets, together with a full alignment to the company's strategy, are highly valued by ESG investors, as it guarantees assurance and transparency on how many tons of CO2 they have contributed to avoid with these investments. The EU taxonomy demands reporting disclosure for both from issuers and from investors, while the final goal of attracting capital to sustainable investments Iberdrola supports the EU taxonomy, and almost all the capex of the group will be directed to activities aligned. Furthermore, it would also be advisable to go beyond these regional ta taxonomies and move to international standards where the alignment of different players could be comparable. In any case, our policy claims are to have an ambitious approach to conclude the EU taxonomy and the EU green bond standard in line with the EU Green Deal targets. As of today, following this strategy, Iberdola is a pioneer and world leader in green financial and sustainable financing, with a volume of operations carried out at group level that exceeds 32 billion. We are the largest corporate issuer of green bonds worldwide, with more than 13.2 billion euros issued since 2014. These funds have been used to finance projects in renewable energy, expansion, digitalization of power grids, and storage. Last February, Iberdrola issued the largest green hybrid bond in history for 2 billion euros, raising funds to finance new offshore wind developments in France and Germany. Our commitment with green finance goes beyond the holding level, and thus our subsidiaries in the US and Brazil have already been tapping this market. We are going to increase our currently 26% of green sources of financing in our debt structure to 45% in 2025, as most of our expected financing during this period will be green or sustainable. Thank you very much and hope you all enjoy the event. Hello, my name is Nicholas Faf, and it's also my pleasure to welcome you to this event. I'm going to provide you as an introduction with a overview of the guidance on climate transition finance provided by the green and social bond principles. Now, starting with a, a snapshot of, of the market, we can see that this is again another landmark year for the sustainable bond market. We are near 900 billion US dollar equivalent issuance to date 
And it looks like we're going to uh, reach or even cross over the threshold of a trillion dollar equivalent of issuance. I think what's also very interesting uh, looking at the uh, at the slide on the right hand side is to see the uh, continuing diversification between different types of sustainable bonds. And I particularly like uh, to highlight sustainability linked bonds, which now represent 10 percent of the overall market. Now, here is an overview of the guidance in a infographic that we published earlier this year at the time of the AGM of the Green and, and Social Bond Principles. You know, this guidance now is followed by the overwhelming majority of the market. In 2020, we did a survey which found that 97% of uh, bonds, of sustainable bonds globally, followed the principles. Now, the infographic shows the two families of uh, products that we have. On the left-hand side, we have the traditional use of proceeds bonds, which cover green bonds, social bonds, and sustainability uh, bonds. And then uh, on the right, we now have the sustainability-linked bonds, which don't focus on use of proceeds, but rather on issuer-level commitments through KPIs and sustainability performance targets. Now, for our presentation today, what's very important is to focus on the thematic guidance, which is at the bottom of the infographic. And this is the Climate Transition Finance Handbook. And you know, the point of this infographic is to show that it applies both to use of proceeds bonds, primarily green and sustainability bonds, but also to sustainability linked bonds. Now, the Climate Transition Finance Handbook is consistent with the earlier work we did on high-level definitions where we linked climate transition finance to the targets of the Paris Agreement. We define climate transition finance in the handbook as the extent to which an issuer's financing program supports the implementation of its climate change strategy. Now, at a high level, the Climate Transition Finance Handbook characterizes the commitments that an issuer needs to make through its climate transition finance strategy as one, being strategic, two, material, three, science-based, and four, transparent. The handbook also confirms that the underlying financing strategy can be carried out through either use of proceeds bonds or sustainability-linked bonds, as mentioned earlier. More specifically, the Climate Transition Finance Handbook says that the issuer strategy needs to address climate-related risks and contribute to alignment with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Further, the climate transition trajectory should be relevant to the environmentally material part of the issuer's business model. The strategy also needs to be science-based with targets and pathways. And finally, even though there isn't a focus on use of proceeds, there has to be transparency on the underlying investment program, including capital and operational expenditures. Now, after that quick overview of our guidance on climate transition finance, I would like to hand over to our great panel which is going to be moderated by Orith Azule from Natexis and Farnam Bigoli from HSBC, both key members of the Executive Committee of the Green and Social Bond Principles. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. Um, we're very pleased to have with us today a, a broad panel of experienced issuers and investors um, to discuss the current state of the transition finance market and give us their experiences as both issuers and investors. Arith and I just wanted to start maybe by setting the scene a little bit, um, particularly in the context of the recent COP26 discussions. Uh, we wanted to maybe uh, give an overview of what we see first in terms of the state of the market today, as well as some of the recent announcements that have been made and how this aligns to um, the broader discussion around transition finance. So you've heard already from Nicholas with regards to the, the growth of the market 
um, nearing, of course, one trillion in issuance um, across green social and sustainability bonds. About half of that comes from either green use of proceeds or sustainability linked bonds. So effectively over 50 percent of that one trillion is, is contributing to, to green transition finance. Across that half, about half of that comes from issuance in Europe, although we do also see healthy volumes of issuance from Asia and uh, the US. Most importantly for today's discussion, about 300 billion of that issuance actually comes from corporate issuers, including key sectors from the transition, materials, energy, and, and utilities. Certainly we saw an ex the acceleration of, of issuance this year, you know, the doubling that, that Nicola uh, pointed to, um, that can at least be, be partly attributed to the momentum around COP26. You've already heard from our colleagues at ECMA and Ibra Drola around the importance of discussions at, at Glasgow. Certainly, I think that um, the, the president of, of COP26 put it best, um, Alex Sharma, when he said that it represented a fragile win for the climate, that we had kept one and a half degrees alive, although only barely. I think if you're an optimist, um, which I am, uh, you can take comfort in the fact that COP26 has developed a kind of infrastructure of accountability around climate ambition and targets, not only for countries through the annual stock take, but also for the private sector. The formation of the new International Standards Board, which has consolidated a number of existing sustainability standards, including CDP, SASB, and TCFD, that will develop a global baseline for sustainability standards and disclosure. Basel will also coordinate with the IFRS to ensure that this standard is enshrined within the, the climate disclosures coming from banks and required by banks. Um, equally, through the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, we've seen five, 450 institutions, including some of the institutions on the call today, committing to adopting science-based targets, adopting near-term targets in alignment with that, and reporting annually on progress. And this focus on, on sort of credible transition plans and, and the evidence of, of progress towards one and a half degrees was certainly echoed by a number of the other regulatory bodies um, during COP26, including the EBA, the Treasury of the UK, which um, has uh, made announced mandatory transition plans for all um, listed companies, and indeed also the FCA. I'll pass over to Orith now to speak a little bit more about the kind of surge of regulation that we're seeing across Europe. Thank you, Farnham. Just a couple of words. I think um, you've all seen, uh, but the numbers are quite telling in terms of um, the outbreak of net zero commitments, both from countries, regions, and companies. Uh, those are a few numbers just, just showing more than um, 600 companies um, over the, the largest world um, companies have already committed to net zero commitments. So we're, we're in, a era, in an era where um, this is going to be required financing for sure, but also preparedness and an action plan. And I think, um, you know, if there is a, if there is a key issue in this matter um, in 2022 is, um, is the, abil the ability to evidence um, the credibility and the preparedness of all parties um, that, um, considering the commitments that have, that have been made. And I think this is exactly what um, the regulation are trying to push through a great number of Disclosure related regulations in Europe, definitely um, at, at all, from all fronts, investors, uh, financial institutions in general, investors, banks and insurers, but also companies. Um, and if, if you go to the next slide, we're talking about, of course, the taxonomy that you all know of, but the taxonomy, as also you, you know, is a, um, I'd say it's a foundation for a myriad of of regulations that are going to go from standards and labels um, to disclosure uh, through benchmarks um, and um, and potentially I think we're, we're seeing the uh, um, the discussion on the prudential regulation getting a bit more lively than it has before um, at uh, at the European level. So without going into any more details, this is this this was more to say that. The climate related disclosure and um, demonstration of preparedness and credibility is, is, is what the regulators are expecting. And, um, and the, um, 
and what the investors are more and more voicing out. And that's what we're going to try um, to discuss today. I guess uh, one of the topics that uh, has been very much discussed on uh, the sustainable finance and especially sustainable bond market is uh, our, um, the, the various formats that can be used to, um, to achieve that, um, these, um, the financing of these uh, strategies. You know, means and results matter. And I think we have com um, complementary tools that can and should be used um, to, um, to fund those strategies. So today we're here to uh, discuss with a, uh, a very senior and knowledgeable panel on, um, on all those um, topics. Um, please welcome Nicole de la Benodo from NL, um, Ashley Shelton from BlackRock, um, Jen Mason from NRG, um, David de Caceres from Repsol, Atlas, and Ketish Botanium from Pimco, that you all know. Thanks so much, Sherry. So we wanted to start maybe by, by hearing a little bit from um, a couple of the issuers on the panel about your motivations when it comes to issuing um, either green or sustainability linked instruments. And Jen May, I'd like to start with you um, because NRG issued your first sustainability linked instrument and your framework indeed last year, and you followed it up with a second issuance um, in August of this year. So can you talk us through your decision making process? You know, what was the value from your perspective of going down this path? Sure. Thank you very much, Farnham and Orth, uh, for inviting NRG to be here. We're really pleased to be part of the discussion and looking forward to it. So as you mentioned, we issued our um, first uh, sustainability-linked bond in November of 2020 uh, with the help of uh, Natixis, who is our um, sole sustainability bond structurer. We were the first in any sector in North America to issue an SLB and only the sixth globally. We used the bond to finance our acquisition of direct energy. So we needed an instrument that would allow us to use the bond's uh, proceeds for general corporate purposes. And that's why we used a sustainability linked bond rather than a, a, a green uh, or sustainability bond. However, I should mention that acquiring direct energy is enabling NRG to reach an additional 3 million customers and, so, uh, and provide them with uh, lower carbon uh, energy products and services. So it is enabling our climate strategy. The value from our perspective was really uh, in two parts. Uh, first, from a strategy perspective, we were able to leverage our already well-established leadership position in sustainability for the benefit of our financing strategy and to really align those two, uh, to, to align those two strategies. We had already set a one and a half degree aligned climate goal. And so issuing uh, a sustainability linked bond on the back of that was, was really a logical extension. Uh, from a financial perspective, uh, we issued a number of other non-sustainability linked bonds that same day. And we were very pleased to see that the sustainability linked issuance was multiple times oversubscribed. Um, we found that many investors were very interested in being part of a product with a sustainability linked format. Um, and as I mentioned, this was the first uh, from a North American company and the first in the energy industry outside Europe. So there was really a lot of interest in being part of uh, that particular, uh, particular tranche of the issuance. Thanks, Jen May. Um, Nicole, I'd love to bring you in here because obviously NL has been a, a pioneer in the sustainability linked bond format. And, and this year, indeed, you've, you've started the, the um, process of actually buying back debt and then reissuing in, in sustainability linked um, bond format. I mean, can you put the this decision into the broader context for NL? Sort of how is the, the financing strategy um, serving your broader transition strategy as a company? Sure, thank you, Furman, and good afternoon to, to everybody. Let's say that over the past five years, NL has transformed to be ready for the electrification of our customers. Uh, we have significant, significantly decarbonized our generation. Uh, we have digitalized our network to accommodate increasing amount of renewable, offering high quality and reliable power. And uh, we have uh, accelerated the, the platformization of the group to, to support and uh, improve our customer proposition. Let's say that the three main pillars of our strategy 
are the decarbonization, electrification, and of course the, the digitalization or, or platformization. With our new plan that we presented uh, November 24th uh, to the financial community, we will mobilize a total of 210 billion uh, that uh, will be invested uh, between 2021 and 2030 uh, that uh, will allow us to be front runners in the electrification process and also to bring forward our own net zero target from 2050 to 2040 on all scopes, so direct and indirect emissions, as uh, we see the next uh, 10 years uh, strategy as uh, pivotal, I would say, to, to address climate change issue. Uh, with our plan to 2030, our main objectives are reach a total renewable capacity of 155 gigawatt, so three times uh, current portfolio, quite an, quite an ambitious target, I would say. Reach a total grid customers of uh, 86 million. We are now at 74 million and the increase of 30% in electricity sold to our customers coupled with the new services. When it comes to the 2022-2024 period, our group will activate around 52 billion of investment, direct and third party investment, out of which uh, around uh, 94% uh, of uh, our, let's say, ownership investments, because our business model is divided between ownership and stewardship business model, but they say, let's say that the majority of our investment are under the ownership business model and the 94% of these investments are already aligned to SDGs and more than 85% of our uh, ownership investments are aligned to the EU taxonomies. Uh, so the mission of the NL Finance Department has always been to serve the business of the company. That's why I started, uh, uh, let's say, underlying our, our strategy and speaking about the business. And uh, it goes uh, without saying that a sustainable business model requires uh, a sustainable finance approach. At NL, in fact, uh, uh, sustainable finance plays uh, a crucial role in supporting the group's uh, sustainable growth, uh, accounting uh, of for approximately half of total gross debt at the end of 2021. We will continue to accelerate on the recourse uh, to sustainable instruments bringing the share of sustainable finance sources on the total gross debt to around 65% in 2024 and to more than 70% by 2030, thus driving the reduction of the group cost of that. And that's why we put in place this year also a huge liability management uh, program, uh, let's say, uh, reaching in advance uh, our target of sustainable finance for 2021. Uh, I would say that Tenet is a pioneer and global leader in, in sustainable finance. Uh, we started our path towards sustainable finance with the green bonds. In 2017, Tenet issued its first green bond followed by two other green bonds in 2018 and 2019. And I have to say that uh, uh, we're speaking about uh, a successful transactions. Uh, then in, in 2019, uh, Enel was uh, the first company in the world issuing, issuing a sustainability linked uh, bond. In 2020, we structured uh, an overall financial strategy linked uh, to our sustainable strategy thanks uh, to the sustainability linked financing. So adding uh, to the uh, sustainable instruments, not just, uh, not just bonds, uh, but I would say, but also uh, revolving credit facility, commercial paper guarantee. So uh, continuing to move uh, towards uh, the, the sustainable finance. And uh, as you were saying in 2021, and the huge liability management program uh, we put in place that allow us to reach uh, two years in advance our sustainable finance target and uh, to refinance around 10 billion of that uh, with the cheaper sustainable instruments uh, with uh, an average cost of 0.5%. Uh, uh, 
after the, the third uh, green bond, uh, we reflected on the role of sustainable finance and how, according to us, of course, uh, sustainable finance should be considered uh, as uh, an accelerator of capital towards uh, sustainable investments, thus uh, serving our sustainable strategy that target, uh, in our case, uh, four core SDGs, because internally we have decided uh, to, uh, let's say, read the ESG aspect under the SDGs, and we have identified four main SDGs that, that are strictly linked to our uh, business. Uh, let's say the SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, mainly linked to the um, energy production, so our global power generation business line, the SDG 9 industry, innovation and infrastructure, mainly linked to the uh, infrastructure and network business line, then SDG 11, sustainable cities and, and communities, mainly linked to uh, our NLX and new services uh, business line, and of course, uh, the SDG 13 climate action that uh, oversee, I would say, all our business line. And uh, in 2019, uh, the uh, first SLB issuance, so with the first SLB issuance, uh, uh, we kicked off the NASA class uh, that uh, well suits uh, our group uh, sustainable strategy from a financial perspective. Thanks to uh, some main characteristic or features of these instruments, uh, such as the reflection of the sustainability strategy of the issuers and not focusing just on specific subset of, of green assets, uh, incentivize uh, the achievement of ambitious uh, uh, and core KPIs and targets, because of course KPIs and, and targets, uh, as also Nicholas Paff was remembering, uh, at the beginning of the discussion are key when it comes uh, to sustainability link bonds. Then the reflection uh, uh, of the uh, financial value of sustainable choices, uh, because sustainability means value and sustainable company at the end deserve a lower cost of debt. General purpose characteristics, thus providing flexibility in the use of funds. Uh, usable uh, uh, by a wider range of issues and sectors so not necessarily capex intensive one and also ideal to support uh, uh, let's say the the transition strategies kpis and targets applied to the whole company instead of of specific transaction this is uh, how uh, we intend the sustainability link bonds uh, and uh, why we have decided to move towards sustainability link bonds. Uh, and yes, uh, let's say that our commitment to sustainable finance is bringing, uh, let's say, uh, uh, bring us uh, to issue uh, just the sustainability link bond uh, going forward, so, so to meet our target. Thank you so much, Nicole. There's a lot there that I hope we can, can can pick back up during today's conversation. I mean, definitely some very interesting comments, especially on, on the cost of, of debt. But one thing that you also said that jumped out at me was, you know, the percentage, the high percentage of your investments that are already aligned to um, either sort of green investments or even more specifically to the EU taxonomy. And um, Graham, I'd, I'd love to bring you in on this because obviously for a, a shipping company, it's a little bit different. Um, the transition pathway is maybe not as, as straightforward and, and clear. Um, and so that, that kind of process of being able to identify projects and use of proceeds is, is not as straightforward potentially. And, and yet you have issued both a, a use of proceeds bond under your blue transition framework earlier this year, and also a sustainability link loan and bond. So how are you communicating through those instruments and, and frameworks, um, the commitments and the pathway that you have as a shipping company towards um, a transition? Yeah, so good point. So good good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to participate. Um, I think uh, people who are aware of the shipping sector is um, under, uh, definitely in a transition phase, and therefore, as sort of one of the largest participants in that sector, you know, you can't sit by and, and do nothing. Um, some of the solutions that have been proposed um, to dealing with emissions in our industry are things like slow steaming, which means that you go slower and you produce less emissions, but that just results in more ships being put on the water. So for me, that's not really a, a workable solution. 
The challenge we have is that there is no one clear pathway to uh, net zero. And um, there's a massive invested infrastructure in supplying the current fuels that we use today. So therefore, you know, there's not a magic bullet and um, the industry is working multiple pathways at the moment um, to reduce um, and, and try and uh, participate in a lot of R&D on new technology and new fuel sources, but we also need to have a supply chain to deliver those. So some of our earlier financings we did were sustainability linked on metrics, um, and they were well received in the marketplace. The last one, as you mentioned, Farnham, was um, our US high yield, which was under the blue transition bond framework. So blue is simply the maritime version of green, and transition is reflecting, you know, as I outlined, um, you know, we don't have a, a target yet to get to the end game, but there are significant investments to be made in that um, process of getting there. And at the moment, you know, for example, we're building uh, 25 dual fuel vessels, which are dual fuel bunker and LNG, which have a significant reduction in CO2 emissions. But of course, it's not the end game. Um, so these will receive well in the market. Um, we're substantially oversubscribed by nearly five times, um, whether that's due to the linkage or other attributes, um, it's certainly part of the mix. Um, I think it'd be highly unusual for us um, going forward to not be uh, issuing uh, debt under any sort of sustainability or uh, transition framework. Um, I think it was mentioned by Xiao Mei and others that when you do these things, it a, becomes a, an integral part of your organisation that you decide to make these decisions. Um, you know, we, we say internally, good companies do the right thing. Um, the, the industry is in transition, our customers are in transition, and we need to be part of that transition. Therefore, you know, we will continue to focus on this. And, um, you know, the, I think the interest, and, you know, we talked about it previously, is, you know, at the moment, the pricing impacts are not that material. I think that will grow over time and that will become more material. But clearly there is um, uh, an access to market and source of funds uh, benefit, I think, which comes with doing this, which certainly puts more competition into the issuances. Great. So I think that's a great point to maybe bring Ashley in on, <laughs> on that sort of investor engagement piece as well. Um, you know, we've now heard from, I think, the issuers some, some pretty consistent themes around, you know, the way in which this aligns to the strategy, the way in which these instruments act as kind of communication tools and also hopefully help to, to pull up um, uh, more investor interest. Um, as an investor, Ashley, what's the role of, of sustainable bonds, either use of proceeds or sustainability linked in, in your portfolio? Why are you buying on them, buying them and how do you report on them? Yeah, sure. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for all the many years of work in this space. You know, BlackRock's been a big supporter of these fixed income instruments um, going back all the way to 2014, where we were uh, one of the founding members of the GBP. Um, and since then, I can't believe the kind of progress that we've had over these years has been amazing, um, much to the work of all the people, you know, on the screen. So, you know, as an asset manager, you know, BlackRock, what we're really doing is responding to the client need that we see. And we have a lot of places where we use these types of instruments. So I'll just, you know, run through some examples of them. So I'd say the first is that we have standalone green bond funds. And I think we, we run maybe, I think, the largest, if not one of the larger uh, green bond funds in the market. Um, and so always just using green bond indices for those, um, evaluating the green bonds as they come to market, uh, reporting on that, et cetera. Uh, we also um, are using um, green bonds and social bonds, sustainability bonds at GSS as part of our impact platform. And so as we launch products with, uh, for, with impact labels, using that as a way to express impact in the fixed income space. Um, we're seeing more and more clients asking not necessarily just what is the risk of you know, the holdings I have in, in my portfolio, what is the risk of climate change, but what good am I doing in the world? What kind of externalities can you report to me? Um, and so um, just as an example, recently have, um, have an EA offering that's an impact offering using GSS bonds around that. 
Uh, also, as part of many ESG funds and fixed income, even if the entire fund isn't uh, a use of proceeds type fund, we can look at other instruments um, and we will usually have some sort of set minimum uh, for green bonds as part of that portfolio. So looking at all sorts of other things around ESG, uh, but making sure that we have a set minimum on those ESG funds to actually have that kind of in impact. Thinking about things like SFDR, how can we prove uh, you know, environmental outcomes, social outcomes, et cetera. Um, the next thing that I would mention, which has been a really interesting development, is the use of this format for sovereign bonds. And so we're always, uh, you know, thinking about this issue. Sovereign bonds make a, bit, a big part of fixed income portfolios. How do we think about positive externalities for sovereign uh, portions um, in a fund? And so now we've had a, a number of uh, a good uh, issuance from sovereigns that we can include an upweight as part of impact in some of these ESG funds that hold sovereigns. Um, in terms of climate tilted funds, having a lot of inquiry on net zero approaches. Um, green bonds are an ideal way to get, especially ones that are focused on mitigation, to get a net zero view. Um, in a fund, we recently just launched a climate high yield fund, um, which has a strong tilt toward green bonds as we see those in this space. And we're looking for more and more issuers of good mitigation bonds in, 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 in the high yield space. And then finally, that I'd mention that there are um, a number of companies in the hard to abate sector um, that would classically be screened by an ESG approach. And I think we want to go above and beyond that. We want to really think about for those projects within the companies that are actually in line with two degrees, are transitioning, could really be defensible as green, how can we make room for those projects um, in an ESG fund? I think a classic example is in the utility space, especially in the US utility space, we have a number of funds that um, would traditionally screen coal generation. Um, but if you have a good green bond from one of these utilities as funding renewables, et cetera, we allow that to actually flow through those classic screens. So in my mind, you know, it's not really a, a question of only green issuers can issue green bonds. It's really a way to get exposure in any kind of company um, for projects that are actually transitioning to two degrees are actually green. And so, it, you know, I know there's a, I think there's a debate in the market, you have to be green to issue a green bond, not necessarily. I would say probably the, the, the punchiest green bond we might get would be a really good green bond from an issuer who otherwise is transition or otherwise be considered brown. Um, and so then to the second part of your question, you know, how do we report on them? And so I, we do a couple things uh, with clients. We obviously will just show the percentage of green bonds in portfolio. We get a lot of inquiry on that, just what is the percentage holding of green social sustainable bonds in portfolio. We do a shading at BlackRock where we have a dark green, medium green, light green. Um, I know we've engaged with the, with the underwriters on the phone about how we view different issuances that come to market. We have a whole taxonomy. And so we will report on what percentage is in the light, medium green, dark green um, shading that we have. And then finally, um, we actually provide impact reporting on funds. Um, to the extent that we have reporting um, from, uh, from companies in terms of the quantifiable impacts that are happening from the projects that we're funding, we can actually take that, download it all, and turn it into you know, an impact report for a fund. So a million dollars invested equal this many of you know, uh, hectares of land reforested, gallons of water saved, emissions reduced, et cetera. Thanks, Ashley. I, I want to pick up on one of the points that you just made, which I think uh, is quite interesting, which which was that, you know, the punchiest green bond um, might be coming from a, an issuer that is not necessarily viewed as green or from a sector that might be considered not green. Um, you know, when we look at issuance over the course of the past year, it does look like a lot of those issuers are looking at instead sustainability linked format rather than than the use of proceeds green format. Um, so Kadesh, I'd love to hear your view on this. I mean, would you agree with Ashley's point around, you know, the market being open to, to both, um, dual formats being open to all sectors? Um, or would you see maybe sustainability linked as the more natural choice? So I think you answer that on a couple of levels. First of all, why did SLVs emerge um, as an instrument for uh, corporate issuers? And I think it was to separate the idea of use of proceeds it, to general proceeds. And what m encouraged us, especially you know, with Nicola's um, issuance when it first came because they were a pioneer in the market, was that the, the nature of it meant that a company could start to move generally in a direction towards sustainability um, without having to have a specific project in mind that they were financing. So, um, you know, that's not in any way meant to describe the green bond market as limiting companies to, um, because if they don't have a project, then they can't do a green bond. Um, and that, as a result of it, the path to sustainability is potentially close to them. 
and the the two sit very nicely next to each other. They're not. They don't. It, companies don't issue SLBs at the expense of the green bond market, um, and we view them entirely as complementary to the idea of the, the pathway to sustainability. Um, but then the next way to answer that question is: What is a company's direction of travel in terms of its business model, and does it sit comfortably? So, you know, the what, the companies that we struggle with that when a green bond comes in particular is that it's really not in keeping with the general direction of travel for that company. That i.e. that it's not really a C-suite buy-in, it's not fundamental to the company, it's not um, as though there's any change in behavior, that it's business as usual but they happen to have a project which could be determined to be green and therefore they're going to bring a, a bond which is green. And we find that um, more challenging to put into portfolios than not. And then to Ashley's point, I think that's very important, is that labelled labeled, um, ESG type um, funds don't necessarily or can't necessarily buy um, issuance from companies which say have greater than 10% in thermal coal, for example. However, if a company does have thermal coal in its business mix, um, yet is trying to transition towards sustainability, a sustainability pathway which is a genuine change from business as usual, and also has a, has a, a target in mind in 2050, for example, for the Paris Alignment, or earlier for, from our perspective, say, let's say 2040, um, and also interim targets as well. SLBs offer a, a, a good alternative and also a credible alternative, but it always boils down to the credibility of the framework of an issue and the, fra- the credibility of frame, framework which derives from the the corporate's de- declaration in the public space. I wonder, David, if, if 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 you wanted to maybe come in on that. I mean, having developed a framework that uses both kinds of instruments, what was behind your choice to to go down that route? And and do you see kind of the the two um, or the, the couple of different levels that Kadesh was walking through in terms of the market's reception? Sure. Hello, everyone. Well, Repsol, as you probably know, is uh, in, a, in a deep transformation process. Um, for us, energy transition is, is a matter of uh, preserving the health of the planet. And, uh, and we, leave, we believe that leads to a, to a new energy model. In, new, in this model, the energy sector must play a, a, a still a leading role and a critical role. And that means we need new materials, that needs we need uh, new fuels, clean fuels, renewable energy, we need circular economy, we need a, a complete industrial transformation. And that, that is what our, our strategic plan aims uh, aims at. And all of these need a huge amount of uh, of financial resources. And that's that's one one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is obviously we have to deserve the access to this uh, financial resource. Uh, and, and that means a credible transition uh, on our side. Uh, being being our most uh, important commitment to, to provide with uh, sustainable and uh, and clean energy, uh, sustainability must be uh, at the core of our business, at the core of our decision-making uh, uh, process. And transition, uh, financing financing transition is uh, the expression of the commitment to the to the sustainability from the financial uh, field from the financial point uh, point of view our uh, our transition uh, financing uh, framework uh, tries to to align exactly with the sustainability uh, strategy we have in the in the company we included as, as we wanted uh, to have as, um, as as inclusive and as wide uh, as possible all the all the reasonable instruments that the sustainable financing market can provide us in order in order to face all this uh, huge transformation we included both uh, both types of uh, of instruments the use of proceeds instruments and the sustainability link bond instruments even more in the in the use of proceeds format, we, we we included also the green the green bonds, which um, uh, focus on project and activity, which eligibility is uh, based mainly on uh, EU taxonomy, and we also included a label for uh, for kind of transition bonds, 
and it was thought for all these uh, all the projects we may have that uh, even if they comply with the uh, with the LGBT criteria of uh, of the green bonds, they still have a positive impact on climate change, and uh, and they they are worth uh, to be financed to the all these all these instruments. On the ESLB side, with a with a more uh, with focus on a, on a forward looking at the at the company level at the corporate level, we decided to 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 incorporate our uh, most our global and most relevant KPI, which is the carbon intensity indicator. And this uh, this indicator uh, uh, complies with all the all the requir requirements. We have uh, from uh, from the sustainability link bond uh, principles, and this indicator is the basis for uh, setting the emissions reduction targets uh, based on scope one, two, and three. We have uh, we may set over time until we get the goal of uh, reaching zero net emissions in two hundred in twenty fifty. We started this uh, this framework. Again, as I said, trying to be as inclusive as possible and, and include as many as many reasonable uh, instruments as, as possible. We started before the the, the ICMA, uh, climate transition handbook was uh, was published. Nevertheless, we we, we aligned with all this with the with this handbook. We implemented the four key elements of this of this handbook, and actually, uh, quite recently, last October, we have renewed. Our, our uh, decarbonization uh, ambition, which we announced on the, on our low carbon day, and we included new reduction targets uh, for this carbon intensity indicator. We include uh, methane intensity reduction targets. We include also new targets in terms of uh, reducing absolute emissions, and we include reinforced commitments and increase uh, internal requirements either in uh, reporting, governance, and uh, capital allocation. All of them as, uh, as a proof of uh, commitment with, uh, with this handbook and uh, uh, generally speaking with all the, all the sustainability uh, financing. Uh, our intention is to incorporate uh, sustainable elements in our financial, uh, in our financial instruments whenever possible and as long as they help to accelerate uh, this process and we know this is a long uh, a long walk uh, uh, it will take a lot of time it will take a lot of uh, effort as well and we know we have to go along with all our stakeholders uh, that means uh, shareholders that mean investors that mean lenders that means employees and everyone involved in this uh, in this transition Thank you very much, David. I guess um, following up on on um, one of Graham's um, statement, um, can you, um, uh, Jen uh, May and Graham and David and Nicole, um, share with us um, some detail of the internal aftermath of such issuances, and um, and what internal value you have drawn from um, from that these exercises. In, in a bit more detail. Sure. Thanks, Oris. I think um, there's not so much an aftermath. I think it's more beforehand um, getting alignment with all the parties. And, and I mean all the parties, you know, and it's um, from the strategic level um, at the executive down through operations and, of course, into finance. And it's, it does establish an interesting dialogue when you've got finance driving um, these sorts of discussions across the organisation. Um, I think probably like most of the other participants, we have been participating internally in R&D and what um, is probably now regarded as ESG activities for, I don't know, probably 15 years. Um, but this is sort of now reframing it. And, I, and this also led to our first ESG report being issued a couple of months ago. So I think it's, it's quite interesting how this has evolved. I'm not saying it's solely around the financing and the finance function that's driven this. But it's been a big catalyst for bringing all of the players together and getting a lot better alignment around what are the metrics, how do you target, set targets, how do you measure them, 
Um, what are all of the external uh, regulatory bodies who are involved in monitoring and controlling? Who are the partners that we have with banks and Sustainalytics and other institutions that help us through this? So building up that whole understanding of the ecosystem around it and how you pull it all together um, was somewhat new for the organisation. And I think it's brought us along immensely in terms of overall awareness and strategic direction around ESG. And so it's not so much afterwards. Afterwards is pretty good. Um, it's really that beforehand piece, which is sort of trying to pull all the threads together and bring everyone's education and understanding up to a common level, which allows you to then approach the market effectively. Jean May, can you um, do you agree with uh, what just Graham just said? Absolutely, I would agree definitely that um, it is a way to pull together even further. At least in our case, um, all of the parts of the company that had been working together and continue to work together on sustainability. So I already mentioned. Um, that we see our sustainability linked bond as a way to even more closely align our financing and our sustainability strategies. Obviously, uh, you know, we continue to work very closely with our uh, finance team, uh, whether it's our treasury, whether it's our investor relations uh, teams, um, we work together with them very closely. The other thing I'll mention is that when we wrote our framework, um, it really forced us to be even more explicit about the levers that we're deploying to meet our climate goals. And so, of course, that means really working with um, others around the company, both from our operations team who are implementing various power plant optimizations to meet our goals, as well as with our home and business teams who serve our customers and who are procuring um, more and more renewables through um, third-party power purchase agreements. So working closely with both the business and the operations teams uh, has been very uh, important as well. And, and we certainly uh, did that before the SLB, but we continue to do it uh, perhaps even more so uh, in the context of the SLB. And Nicole, with your um, recurrence pattern, on this market, is can you? Um, is there any um, additional inter internal value that you want to share with us? Uh, sh sure, but I have to say that uh, Graham and, and John May already said uh, a lot of the points. Uh, of course, when it, when it comes to NL, uh, given the fact uh, that uh, it, it was kind of innovation, our sustainability link bond, because it was the first on on, on the market. Uh, uh, we did a lot of, of pre-work, of course, uh, I would say both uh, internally with our top management uh, that, of course, uh, did a lot of challenge uh, on, on the idea, but uh, uh, at the end, uh, both uh, the CEO and, and CFO realized that uh, the idea was uh, sub substantially, I would say, about putting the money where, where the amount is as sustainability linked finance. Uh, really links uh, the strategic and sustainability commitment of the company to the core debt terms. Uh, and uh, uh, we did uh, a lot of work uh, with the uh, multiple functions within NL from sustainability to strategy, uh, investor relation, legal administration. Of course, it's something uh, that given the fact uh, that it's very much linked to the business, of course, involved also um, the business lines uh, and uh, uh, KPIs uh, that uh, need, of course, uh, to be shared uh, at uh, all levels uh, internally. And uh, we did a lot of work also towards uh, the financial community with investors, of course, uh, because it was something uh, completely new. Um, I have to say that, uh, as already Katish mentioned at the beginning, of course, with, with PIMCO uh, on the sustainability link bonds, uh, it was kind of a partnership uh, uh, because uh, we, uh, let's say, bring uh, uh, somehow together these new instruments on, on the market. Uh, but uh, we did a lot of uh, meetings uh, with uh, with investors. I remember so, uh, uh, probably the first meeting that we had on sustainability, it just to present sustainability link bond one of the first awards was, was was with ashley and uh, in us probably and we started uh, let's say reasoning about that uh, it, it wasn't so great i would say that that meeting at the beginning but uh, 
she uh, she did a lot of, of challenge constructive ch challenge uh, and uh, it was of course useful uh, to to find uh, a product uh, that was kind of a um, a win-win solution for both issuers and, and investors uh, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, the idea was uh, to uh, to bring on the market a product uh, uh, also easy, uh, replicable for, for other issuers uh, and um, uh, also standardized, uh, kind, of, kind of standardized this market and uh, for sure ICMA uh, uh, helped uh, a lot uh, on this uh, with the release of uh, the uh, sustainability link bond uh, bond principle so yes uh, i would say that um, i i i do agree with both graham and, and jenny jenny may uh, a, a lot of, of pre work uh, when, when it comes to the, the aftermath uh, it uh, it was probably just to following the path already started uh, also in other aspect uh, not just finance uh, but for example the, the reporting and the idea to have an integrated reporting that consider both uh, industrial and sustainability strategy because here the idea is uh, it's really to have sustainability embedded uh, in the business and uh, I do agree with with Cathy it's uh, the valuation of the uh, the the issue at the end uh, that uh, is uh, is the focus. Uh, I, I would say both on use of proceeds and and general purpose instruments at the end. Coming to Ashley and Ketish, thank you, Nicole. Um, after this first year of SLB outbreak, um, what's what's your first take? Um, do you think this market is up to the challenge when it comes to ambition, integrity, and traction? Um, and um, what are the you know the key success factor for for this um for this to work and and how uh, maybe more for ashley how is that um to be combined with the uh, use of proceeds uh, market yeah maybe i'll kick us off you know i think that you know one thing that you know i'd want to stress and i think sometimes this gets lost with capital markets teams necessarily who are working on transactions in the capital markets is that investors are looking at these companies holistically. Um, we are looking at the company profile. Um, we are interested in what the goals of the company are. And there are lots of indicators that we can use to, to think about what are forward looking goals, whether it's uh, setting SLBs, um, making net zero uh, sign ons, um, you know, the CEO pay link to corporate chart, you see all these kinds of things. And so, um, so I think that in the context of looking at a, at a, at a company's overall strategy, um, the SLB is an interesting signal. Um, and we can see, you know, are these targets that they've set, are they core to their sustainability challenges? Um, you know, if you have a company that has environmental challenges as, as part of their material sustainability challenges, making KPIs that are not, you know, related to that necessarily, um, then you sort of, you know, have to question how, how important are these KPIs to this company's journey? And so I think that investors are, you know, evaluating these bonds as they come, trying to understand how, how significant these are, uh, these step ups, are they just business as usual? Um, how um, punitive might the step be in terms of for a forcing mechanism to, you know, to have the company change? Or is it really something that's just a signaling to highlight, um, you know, to highlight to investors what the company is doing holistically? And so I think we're all trying to kind of flush out, you know, flush out that. Um, you know, I think probably what we will start to see is some sort of scoring of how ambitious the target could be for a company. Those kinds of things are really helpful to wonder, do we treat this particular QCIP any differently than we would treat all the parent debt of this company? Um, so I know, and soon, you know some of our panelists mentioned that they're going to do all of their debt this way. And so, so I think that will be the question in the market is as investors, if, if these are KPIs at the parent level, you know, should we just treat all the, all the debt the same as a sort of signaling um, for, for a company's forward goals? What's pleasing for us is that the variety of names which is coming now um, and the breadth of the market has grown. The volumes remain um, less than say the green bond market, but then I think it's that uh, the market itself is getting used to this product. It's, it's only a couple of years old. Um, what's interesting is that it's both venturing into the high yield market as it is an investment grade. And when when um, when the green uh, sustainability link bond principles were written, 
I think the objective at the time was to give the market the latitude to grow and the market the ability to sort of express itself a little bit um, before starting to get more uh, demanding in terms of, say, structures, etc. When we speak to issuers, we, we try to be very clear about a number of things which we think are useful for sustainability linked bonds. The first of those is the assessment date and the relevance of that assessment date to the life of the bond. So we find it a, quite um, a struggle, for example, if you have a 10-year bond, is that the assessment date is in year 9 or year 10. We find that, say, um, where is the ambition or the rate of ambition um, measurement along that pathway. And we would uh, encourage issuers, if you are going to do a 10-year, just to maybe think about putting that assessment point in year five. Um, you know, it, it's, it makes it more credible. Um, and I think to Ashley's point and the point that I made earlier is that it's got to be an ambitious target. It can't be just incremental little steps. It's got to demonstrate a willingness to change. Um, and and I th that is quite key. Um, and then sort of to get rather technical um, is that, say, in the high yield market, for example, you occasionally get um, callability in bonds um, before the assessment date. And then again, that sort of stretches to an extent the, the credibility of the structure. Um, you know, it's not not fatally by any stretch, but it does mean that, say, it means that, say, if you have a call before the assessment point, then it, is the assessment point the important bit or is it the call date? Um, and I think, again, that's a consideration for people to think about when they're arranging a deal. But overall, I think, um, given that we were, as a firm, very keen for the development of this, uh, this type of issuance, um, it's been pleasing to see it grow. Um, we anticipate it to continue to grow. Um, we anticipate it to be a pathway for companies that wish to transition their general business rather than just fund specific projects. So, yeah. Thank you, Katish. Maybe um, a, a couple of words of the challenges encountered. I mean, you've started mentioning some of them. Uh, um, SPTs, timing of the uh, of the uh, uh, the milestones, the assessment dates, as you as you call them. Um, maybe. Uh, David, Jan May, Bram, Nicole, you want to share um, in a th synthetic fashion, if I if I may, a few of the key challenges that you've encountered in the process of a product, which, as uh, Ketis just mentioned, was designed um, and 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 has been framed so far in a manner to allow um, the market to to shape itself, and we're probably getting to a point where we might want to um, clarify some of that framing to help it uh, grow further. So, um, David, if you want to share um, some of your views on, on what, what have been the key challenges in the process. I think that the financing uh, function uh, has changed dramatically with all these, uh, with all these instruments. I remember some, some time ago, uh, that was your own decision uh, on the on the financial side now, as uh, as all my colleagues have uh, have also presented, you are pretty much connected to, to to all the all the business units and all the corporate units. Uh, now you need the the the, the, the inputs of, of everyone, of every and, and every every single change in 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 around or internally in your in your company. Can be affecting your uh, planification, can be affecting your strategy, and your financial strategy, and this has. Uh, I think this this has been very helpful for everyone. I think um, we all understand now internally much more of uh, sustainability and sustainability process. But I find that many many units they also understand better now finance, uh, and probably. We all understand more the business, but also we understand more, and we know much more now from our investors. We know more from our uh, relationship banks. We know more from our customers. We know more from uh, uh, providers, and, and and generally speaking, from our uh, stake uh, stakeholders. 
the process for us has been uh, has been some uh, somehow difficult uh, because being the first time we have to put in place all these uh, all these processes as you say with the with the requirements needed in in uh, in every for for any instrument because I think it, it affects uh, use of proceeds and it, and it affects also just and everything linked. Uh, the, the observator, all, all the processes around uh, the observation uh, dates, the KPIs, the definition of the KPIs, the, the fulfilling the requirements of all these uh, the KPIs has been incredible uh, in, uh, in internally. And I think, uh, but I think this uh, the, this process uh, is is being very successful. I think uh, a huge uh, a huge part of the market is demanding. An inclusive uh, instrument as uh, SLVs. I think this this will go uh, higher and higher. Probably green bonds um, were not enough for all the all the huge financing that has to be redirected to to all this uh, transition process. And I think uh, I I think uh, all companies uh, should start if they have not. They should start uh, walking through this uh, path. I think mainly I can sort of concur with David's comments. I think, you know, we talked a bit about the internal alignment. That's a, a fairly heavy lift to get everyone aligned um, pre going to market. But I think uh, as David commented, the other piece is um, a sort of shift in mindset away from shareholder to stakeholder. And, you know, that sort of magnifies and multiplies your base of people that you need to work with uh, several fold. From just dealing with direct investors and I, I know that's sort of a, a fairly common element that's um, pervasive across a number of businesses through a number of different themes but when you start to look at climate change ESG etc and you start to focus on that yeah it's one thing getting aligned internally but um, understanding who that broader stakeholder audience is externally and then making sure you build the appropriate networks and have the right discussions with them is also quite a complex area to navigate. And, um, you know, I think it's just the, the only other comment I would make is that, you know, earlier on, you know, we we're talking about we lock these in things in for a number of years. I think that's OK when it comes to use of funds because it's um, relatively straightforward. But when you're linking it to performance metrics, um, then it gets interesting because over duration, those metrics shift, the approaches change and targets can actually become actually more aggressive um, and more meaningful. So I'm not really aware at the moment of how you recalibrate those things um, or whether you just go out with a new bond and, and pay out the old one and put in a new set of metrics, for example. I'm sure the banks would love that. But um, bottom line is that um, I think we're still learning, you know, and we've got to remain pretty agile in terms of how we manage this. I think every company doesn't want to get ahead of itself in terms of commitments. You know, we want to sort of be progressive and we want to push forward, but obviously we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we um, extend ourselves too far and get into a position where we can't deliver. And um, so it's a very fine, fine balance at the moment. And I think we've got to manage it cautiously. Yeah, you're all amazing. The very topic that come up in um in the discussion we have within the sustainability link bond principle working group in the next phase of what's what's needed in terms of guidance and um and support to the market yeah i mean actually the question you asked was about challenges i mean i would say that our issuance really didn't have a lot of challenges because it um it relied on a goal that we had already set before um which, uh, as I mentioned, is one and a half degree aligned, and it's been validated as such by the science-based targets initiative. So in terms of the KPI, um, it's a well-known KPI. Uh, the measurement and reporting of it, we've reported it annually to the, among others, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, in our sustainability report, and uh, we have a separate greenhouse gas emissions report that is assured by our um, auditor, which is KPMG, who is also our financial auditor. So we've done that for a number of years. And as I said, you know, I think what we, um, you know, base the SLB on the KPI and the SPT were very well 
uh, recognized. So we, we haven't had uh, you know challenges arising from that. We also had our framework um, uh, have a second party opinion issued around it uh, by Video Iris, um, and they said that um, the framework is aligned with the core components of the sustainability linked bond principles and in line with the best practices that uh, they've identified. So I think all of that together actually made for a rather smooth uh, issuance in terms of um, you know, the governance around our bond. Um, can I jump in maybe because um, I, I think Graham sure. uh, raised a, a really interesting point, which is around the kind of shifting um, targets and, and how that might um, be addressed within both frameworks, but also within issuances. I mean, um, we've now seen the the concept of the kind of yearly ratchet or stock take embedded within the, the, the agreement at Glasgow. Um, and so what are the panelists' expectations with regards to how this is going to um, affect either the development of their frameworks, or maybe I'll go to Kedish first and ask you, how is this going to change your assessment of frameworks um, this kind of um, uh, kind of global push towards continuous um, review of whether targets are indeed ambitious enough. Does it change the way that you look at things? Is it going to increase your reliance on things like SPTI? I think the way to look at this from our perspective is um, the framework concept shouldn't change, right? Is that you, we believe that the framework, as I said, is the most important aspect of issuance and it's part and parcel of the issuer's credibility as well. So when, say, uh, you know, to use Nicole as the example, or to use uh, a, a, any, any utility as an example, if they do a series of um, SLBs, SLB1 will have a target, SLB2 will have a, have a more ambitious target, SLB3 will have more ambitious target, and the progress um, continues. So it's a relatively straightforward pathway. For example, in other hard to abate industries, for example, let's say uh, steel or um, cement, um, it depends on the initial conditions of the company. So some companies, uh, initial conditions for them, for example, to get to net zero commitments, Paris alignment, some of them, the, the rate of change at the start will look um, relatively slow because they have a much ch more challenging state um, at the at the initial conditions, um, but over time you'll find that if they are if those ambitions are to be realised, then that you need to maybe start slowly but accelerate into the end. Um, so what we're trying to do is prog uh, track that progress, and we like the idea of regular issuance coming in this form because then it sort of reaffirms that commitment to uh, to. A gradual path of change, um, if that makes sense, and it also reinforces the c commitment of the company. So yes, I think the idea that of having regular issuance in this space is a is a positive development, and it also allows that company to underline its credentials as well. Thanks, Kadesh. Ashley, um, we'll be interested to hear your views. There's also a series of questions that are coming through on the Q and A. Um, that I'm wondering if you might comment on with regards to whether green bonds should also have some kind of penalty for non-compliance. Yeah, sure. So, so on your question about um, Glasgow, I would say I think my comments will be <clears throat> in line with what Kadish says. Is that you know what we're really when you're talking about climate, you're talking about mitigation. What we're really looking at is that you know like basically science-based pathways to basically net zero by 2050. You know that's what we're looking for. You know two degree, one and a half degree alignment type pathways, and those are different for different sectors. Um, obviously, the certain sectors have longer um, to do this. Um, and we do work with the science-based targets initiative. And, and actually, some of the, um, the the SLBs that I've seen in the market, I think, oh, that's an interesting target outlook. And the company's already set a science-based target. And so what, what the way that we're evaluating issuers is we do look at things like SBTs in our ESG funds. If you are an SBT set issuer, you are in what we call this PEX, which is positive externality category for our issuers in fixed income. And so um, to the extent that SBTs, um, I don't know if necessarily they're getting you know updated you know, the science, what the science is, we, we do have some debates probably starting to brew around what scenario you're choosing. Um, and then we can debate about, you know, the, the underlying climate scenarios used, but I don't think it necessarily changes anything. I think we're, we're looking for that. Um, 
the other thing I would say is that um, we will probably start to see more and more development of something called the implied temperature rise metric that's just starting to brew. Um, that's the one number metric that we'll see for companies, whether they're two degree, three degree, four degree aligned, really looking holistically at the company's um, spend, R&D, forward type commitments, et cetera. And those are just, I think, starting to emerge as tools that investors can use to understand a company's alignment toward that sector pathway. And um, so that's really exciting, uh, exciting uh, stuff happening. And then on the question of um, the green bond penalty, um, you know, I think that um, we haven't been in a situation where we, I think I've seen one or two SLBs around green bonds where there was a step if they didn't, you know, stick with the green bond format. But um, we have had a couple instances in the market where uh, an issuer has issued a green bond and um, it has not ended up using the use of proceeds as stated. Um, so I think that there is, you know, there is risk that we can take on if we're paying through the mark, through the curve for green bonds that it's associated with that. I think that we do need to make sure that we do due diligence. We do need to get reporting, annual reporting from companies um, to the extent that they are um, allocating use of proceeds as intended um, if there is a market premium associated with that. And we, so, you know, as a reminder to the audience, we're not taking different credit. A risk on these projects, we're taking credit risk of the parent. Um, so, you know, philosophically, we're floored, right, at the at the curve for the parent issuer on that. And so, as we get more and more of a premium, I think there'll probably be more and more of a focus of is this company use, losing this green bond label or not, and that could be market risk um, that that investors are taking on. So, I don't really see a, a need right now for any kind of penalty. There, there is already, I would say, a reputational penalty uh, for companies that would you know, issue a bond and not use proceeds at intent, certainly, you know, access to that type of funding or that type of investor base um, would be damaged if, if, that, if that were the case. I think you're, uh, if I can step in front of it, um, you're alluding the, uh, the, the pricing topic, which is also animating a lot of the questions we're seeing in the Q&A. Maybe um, it's be, it would be interesting to, um, to hear a bit more about, about this from, uh, from the panelists. Um, of your observation from a pricing perspective in the primary and in the secondary markets um, from both formats. Maybe Graham, um, you've, you've got both both out there. Uh, do you want to share some of your observation? Yeah, I think I made the comment uh, earlier that, you know, there really isn't a material pricing, direct, direct pricing impact. Um, when I look at the sustainability linkages and, you know, to the problem, the, it, the question raised around penalties, I guess it's not getting an incentive is the same as getting a penalty in a way. Um, so if you've got a, a step down uh, in rate associated with something and you don't get it because you don't deliver, I, I guess that's the same as a penalty. But um, I think um, this market is relatively mature and maturing, but it's also still evolving. And um, as I touched on earlier, I think the, the benefits come from access to capital and therefore competition, and that directs, uh, that impacts on pricing um, because you've got more competition, obviously, for, for your instruments. But um, so it's a bit hard to gauge the direct impact on pricing, um, but I still think um, it's got further to go. And I think there probably be, will be, over time, further polarisation between the sorts of products we're discussing here uh, and just sort of your general run of the mill, non uh, linked, uh, sustainability linked or sort of green bond related financing. So, uh, like I said, not, not a massive direct impact that I can see at the moment, but, um, you know, you need to be part of it and I think it's going to evolve um, and it will be a competitive advantage in pricing in the market, which will be much more direct going forward. Maybe Nicole, you can um, you can comment on that pricing element because um, you've also sure. like this and been vocal about it. I tend to disagree a bit uh, with with Graham when uh, he's saying that there is uh, no impact on pricing in the sense that uh, for sure it's not a huge impact uh, because also of the low interest rate environment, of course, uh, that, that we need to take into account. Uh, let's say that when it comes to NL, for example. Uh, we saw uh, an impact in terms of pricing with our first uh, sustainability link bond issuance. Uh, 
uh, it depends on the market if we're speaking about US or, or Europe, but let's say that uh, we saw an impact in terms of uh, b between 5 and 15, 20 basis points, but just because uh, we um, transparently spoke with investors just saying, uh, guys, uh, we are keen uh, to take a commitment in two, three years time. But what we're saying here is that sustainability means value and uh, you should recognize the value of sustainability, uh, recognize uh, a sort of discount uh, at the beginning. Of course, when you go forward and you build your secondary curve, it's not anymore. Uh, uh, there is not anymore this this impact, but just because you are using your secondary curve to build the pricing uh, uh, ahead. But if we look to our also secondary curve between the brown, call it brown bond or green bonds or sustainability link bond, because. Uh, uh, when it comes to green bonds, uh, we, we didn't see this impact at the beginning, but with the third issuance of green bonds, given the fact that we then uh, priced uh, the third green bond, uh, uh, taking into account uh, the, the green bond curve, uh, even there we, we have seen uh, um, a small, uh, let's say, discount with respect to brown bonds. But I, I think that it's um, it, it's natural. It's natural consequences of the sustainable finance and of the, of the fact that uh, sustainable companies are probably more resilient, uh, less risky, and therefore deserve also a lower cost uh, of debt. Uh, we're probably just uh, waiting also uh, credit rating agencies to really incorporate uh, the ESG valuation within the credit rating, not just. Uh, considering the ESG aspect as a, a separate tool, even though uh, uh, we're seeing now also credit rating agencies buying a, a second party provider or uh, um, that uh, are at the end uh, in the middle uh, of, of this kind of, uh, of instruments uh, when it comes uh, to, to, to the ESG. Uh, rating and, and factors because as uh, also uh, Jenny May was saying, uh, also when it comes to NL, our sustainability link financing framework has a second party um, opinion uh, provider and all our KPIs uh, have a certification uh, both uh, when it comes to the shorter term KPI and uh, longer, ter longer term uh, KPI and we're speaking about uh, our auditors when it comes to renewable installed capacity or DMV but also we're also speaking about uh, SBTI when it comes uh, to the CO2 reduction our CO2 path uh, given the fact that, that uh, um, we uh, have to demonstrate that uh, we uh, are following uh, the Paris alignment. Uh, uh, and when it comes uh, to, uh, let's say, um, KPIs, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's true what, what Ketish was saying, of course, that we do have multiple SSLB now on the market uh, and we updated our KPIs uh, following our uh, at the end uh, business plan so when we do update uh, the KPIs uh, within our industrial plan then we do update also our sustainability link financing framework uh, embedding uh, the updated uh, KPI and so for example we do have uh, the, the 2019 uh, sustainability link bond that is uh, uh, linked uh, to GHG scope one emission uh, reaching a carbon intensity lower than 125 uh, gram per kilowatt hour in, in 2030. And then we updated in 2020 the target and now we do have 82 gram per kilowatt hour. So it's uh, kind of, uh, I think, normal to have updated KPI and uh, to, to rise the bar, I would say. You, you're answering to the last few questions. Panam, do you want to take over from here? For the last uh, I will do. I'm just conscious that um, Kadesh is going to yeah. jump off and I wanted to give him a chance to, to maybe respond on this pricing uh, question or also a few other um, questions that have come up on, on SLBs, um, particularly around kind of the, um, uh, what happens with issuers that might miss their KPIs in an SLB structure, how you would classify that um, as an SLB AF coupon step up or not? So 
we try and look at the SLB format without the step is that we when we enter into discussion with an issuer we look to the company from a credibility perspective and so we're not going to buy a company just because it's got an SLB format it's got to be more than that and I think that's got to be the strictest the, 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 the approach you take what drives you to buy a credit for a portfolio should not be um, the format of the bond uh, in the context of say it has a step per se it should be the quality of the underlying issuer their framework their ambition etc um, so you know without sounding really pedantic that's it's sort of going back over the what I've said before um, and with regard to say advantageous pricing or not again you need to buy bonds in the context of the value versus the secondary market versus the potential compression for the spread um, of what is the um, spread versus its rating what's the trajectory of that company's um, uh, credit rating likely to be are you being compensated from the spread terms and then you know if it has a label and Ashley will probably laugh when I say this but the label doesn't confer virtue um, therefore it, th th that spread will be determined by the market Thank you, Katish. I think um, in the Q and A, you could probably answer it actually. Um, should passive ETF be a more prominent instrument to accelerate change towards sustainable finance? Um, maybe Ashley, you could share your experience on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know there are some questions here that are not necessarily just around ESG and sustainability. There are themes that are going on in markets, and I think that you know. Um, the popularity of the ETF structure is, I think, something that's resonating with investors. Um, I think low-cost passive is something that's, uh, building blocks is something that's resonating with investors. And so I think it's just, uh, you know, a function of, um, of providing sustainable investments for people in the format um, for which they're most, you know, digestible to them. And so, and some of that as active, some of that is passive, some of that is mutual fund structure, some of that is ETF fund structure. You know, I would say that, you know, um, specific to the ETF, I think, you know, the first fund that we launched was um, was actually a mutual fund in USITS uh, because it was early days and um, the liquidity, the secondary liquidity in green bonds was not what it what it is today. And so and to the extent that the ETF offers you a lot of liquidity, um, we were, I think, a little bit nervous that um, that we didn't want to provide that liquidity too early in a market that was 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 having wider bid offer spreads in secondary. I think that has changed. And you see us in the market launching ETFs that are green bond ETFs. We have one in, in the US, we have one in, in Europe now. So I think that's just a reflection of the types of secondary turnover that we're starting to see as the market grows and we get more issuers in the space. Um, just to come back on one of the comments uh, that was mentioned about pricing, I think this is a really interesting topic because we do have some, um, some data points now that we can really point to when we've had big sovereigns come to market versus very well established pricing curves to see precisely was it that it was a Tuesday at 11 was it that our rates were low where is it you know there was a COVID flare like what caused the pricing difference in this and so now when we think about UK debt German debt etc pricing off those curves we can really isolate what was the quote-unquote greenium and I think on those bonds you see anything from four to six to eight basis points greenium um, at any given time. And so um, some of this is being captured in the new issue market, as you guys you know, are well aware, and some of it happens in the secondary market. And so I think why this is so interesting is because we really get back to the point of what is the whole point of this exercise, right? Why are we creating all these green bonds? You know, and there have been critiques leveled where the company's doing this anyways, and you know, what is the point? The idea is that if you can create a price incentive for companies to change their capital allocation, they'll probably do so. And so how do we think about the cost of capitals within companies and incentivizing more green spend and thinking about this asset class we've developed, which is very clean and has guidelines around it and universal standards encouraged by some sort of regulatory support, right? So where are we going with these country labels? And if we can think about it in something that there is a price benefit, and I do think investors are willing to pay for good green bonds. Um, I think we are testing what that limit is and we'll continue to test that. But I think companies will acknowledge that, you know, an eight or 10 basis point uh, pricing premium on a green bond, especially if your assets want to is significant 
significant money and can certainly pay for the costs associated with the setting up program, the reporting, and maybe over time then change you know, capital allocation. I'll leave that to my, um, to my issuers to discuss. But when we really think about green bonds and you know, these type of GSS bonds and SLBs as an impact product, what kind of impact are we having on them? That's really, I think, what we're trying to capture. And I think we're building the infrastructure to enable this sort of public-private partnership to get us there. Thank you, Ashley. There are a few questions in the in the list of, that are interesting. Um, some around the impact reporting and the need for a harmonized impact reporting for both SLB and green uh, bonds over the lifetime of the um, of the instruments. Um, is that something you would call uh, for? Regarding reporting. Uh... Uh, I can I can tell you out our our internal experience. We're trying uh, we're trying to have uh, not also the official KPIs or official um, uh, STPs uh, for the SLV, but also we try to incorporate, uh, as I said, sustainable elements to all the all the financing instruments we have in uh, we have in place. And therefore, we need uh, probably KPIs, shorter term KPIs than the ones we have uh, published for, for intermediate and, uh, and long term. And one of the key aspects of, uh, of this um, experience is we need all these uh, KPIs still to be uh, verified, externally verified, and we need all these uh, KPIs to be, to be reported. And uh, we found out that uh, many, many of the KPIs we, we may be thinking about is uh, was a, it's a hard work, it's a difficult work uh, to find the right um, the right uh, measures and the and the right way of, of uh, reporting it. But I think that, that that is going to be key. I mean, uh, all all uh, all this uh, system, all this uh, sustainable financing methodology is uh, obviously based on the, on the external verification of all the all the KPIs and uh, all the STPs. And uh, just a few words on uh, what you were talking about before. Obviously, uh, and, and related to this, obviously, uh, pricing is uh, is uh, is very important. But I, I've got the impression that this at this moment, at this point of time, uh, reputation, reputational consequences and reputational impacts of, uh, of uh, not complying with uh, with uh, STPs or not complying with uh, with KPIs, either if they are published or not, or uh, uh, are, are more key and more important even than uh, than prices. Thank you very much, David. I think there are um, being conscious of time. There are a few questions around the uh, the green bond standard, uh, the EU green bond standard. Um, uh, that, directly um, addressed to the, uh, the issuers around the panel, uh, whether you think that your issuances in the future, uh, one or two years down the line, are likely to be EU green bond standard compliant. And, and you know, more generally, what's your view on the potential mandatory character of the EU green bond standard? Maybe I'll kick off. Uh, when it comes, let's say that the EU Green Bond Standard are somehow a cut and paste of the ICMA Green Bond Principles. So if you are compliant with the, with the ICMA Green Bond Principles, uh, you should be compliant also with the EU Green Bond Standard with the, some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, yes. Uh, um, but uh, let's say that also when... Um, Europe uh, recently issued uh, green bonds and they are compliant with ICMA green bond principles and not the EU green bond standard because, of course, uh, there is also some, uh, let's say, noise, uh, you can call it in, the, in that way, around uh, the EU taxonomy. So probably uh, we need uh, uh, to fix uh, the things on the EU taxonomy and then to move towards uh, the EU Green Bond standards. Uh, but uh, I would say that at least when it comes to, to NL, uh, I do not, and uh, to, to our Green Bonds, that uh, because we, we do have also three Green Bonds uh, 
uh, outstanding yet. Um, I do not uh, see our green bonds uh, not uh, EU standard uh, green bond compliant uh, to, 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 to tell you the, the truth, uh, but of course uh, we will see how uh, the, the standards uh, will evolve. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, let's say that uh, having the, the EU uh, on the market uh, with green bonds uh, compliant with the ICMA green bond principle, not with the EU green bond standard probably uh, we we need to, to to really carefully analyze also what uh, what we are doing in in that regard. Uh, however, the EU is uh, is doing a lot of work around sustainable finance, uh, and I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, they will address uh, all the um, the issues uh, that uh, are are coming around uh, the topic. I actually wanted to come back to an earlier comment, which is around ambition oh. and just mention that um, in our framework, um, we do have what's called a most ambitious clause, uh, which Natixis encouraged us to include and which we understand was unique at the time. Uh, and that mandates that any additional SLBs that we issue in the future with the same KPI uh, SPT observation date will have uh, the same, uh, or ha we'll have an SBT target of uh, equal or greater climate ambition. Um, and in addition, if we issue those new SLBs, any outstanding SLBs, including the one that we currently have, um, would have its SBT automatically adjusted to reflect that most ambitious um, KPI target. So really what that does is it aligns all of the outstanding SLBs to have the same and more ambitious targets over time. And it avoids the coexistence of um, you know, multiple targets and it facilitates efficient uh, reporting as well. So I just wanted to mention that in the context of um, the discussion here. Thank you, that's, that's definitely useful. We've got quite a number of questions around the, um, the penalty for non-compliance, uh, you know, be it for green or SLBs. Uh, which we've um, we've we've touched upon. Upon um, anyone wants to um, to address this, um, for example, we're talking. You know, we're being asked about um, the penalty going to investors, as opposed to uh, um, to sustainability causes or or um, let's say uh, in, impact related investments, uh, impact providing investments. Um, are there um, any views out there, Ashley? Do you have a view on that? Um, I, you know, I think that's been a, a conversation that's been debated about having maybe a coupon payment to like an NGO or a charity. I think, you know, it gets a little bit blurry in terms of what is philanthropy and what is investing when you kind of mix those two things together. Um, you know, again, I think the maybe we get to a place where the coupon steps are, you know, more than a, a handful of basis points and they actually become something that um, and then the ambition, the targets become really ambitious. And then maybe you could see something where there was some optionality in that risk that the investor was taking. Maybe they pay up for that SLB with that option that they have for that step. I don't think currently there's any option out, any priceable optionality in that market. Um, but you never know where we could, like I said, when we started this in 2014, we never thought we'd be here today. So who knows where we're going to be, you know, in five years. Um, so, um, so I think, you know, I think it does create, you know, um, to Jami's comment about the changing the steps. I, I thought that was really interesting in that. You know, one of the, the challenges of these are they're, they're structured notes, if you will. Like, where do you record those steps? You know, where do you where do you book those in terms of prospectuses? You know, how do you model them? Um, you know, that kind of thing. I think, you know, if it's steps, you know, it's like any other structured note. Even if it's steps, you know, for, for some um, portfolios, it's still considered a structured note on in the SLB space, but in like the classic step up. Um, structured step up market. And so, you know, I think that that, that that technical is probably something that we just need to work through and how we treat them um, when they step or if they're floating steps or where the payment goes to, et cetera. Thank you very much which, for what has been a very rich discussion um, addressing a lot of the dimensions of the SLB. Um, it's the beginning of that, um, of that product for sure. And um, and I think the SLBP uh, working group is a uh, is a is a good witness of uh, the remaining opening open questions. 
um, uh, on on the on the, on the, this market and its de development. Uh, but um, thank you very much for sharing your views today. Good afternoon. It is an enormous pleasure to be delivering the closing remarks at ICMA's conference on the role of sustainable bonds in financing the transition to net zero. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank ICMA for inviting me to this landmark event. An event which is, of course, taking place only a short time after the closing of the COP26 summit in Glasgow. This summit dominated not only the sustainability agenda, but also the wider geopolitical agenda globally. And I think it's fair to say that one important outcome of the summit was a focus on the critical role which finance must play in the transition to net zero. So this seminar today is taking place at a very opportune moment. We've just heard this afternoon from a number of leading international issuers and investors about their own sustainability plans. And given the overall growth in the sustainable bond market, as well as the fact that the UK government launched its debut sovereign green bond, or green guilt in our terminology, just this past September, this was a 12 year maturity bond swiftly followed by a 32 year bond only a few weeks later in October. So it might be timely to share a few reflections on these transactions. For the UK government and for us at the UK DMO, the inception of our green financing program without doubt represents a significant milestone. Certainly a milestone for the UK as it looks to position itself as a leading green finance hub, but also arguably for the ESG market more generally. The UK government's green guilt issuance and indeed the government's overall green financing programme clearly supports the UK's ambitious environmental and climate goals. The September issue broke a few records in the sovereign green bond market. Records in terms of size, level of investor demand and so on. And the October 32 year issue also broke a different record as the longest maturity sovereign green bond to have been issued. And these transactions governed by a framework document which was fully aligned with the 2021 green bond principles published by ICMA, as well as mapped to the UN sustainable development goals, they introduced some innovations into the sovereign green bond market, which might be worth highlighting. So first, the UK government has committed to report on the social co-benefits, in addition to the environmental impact of funds raised under its green financing program. Examples include job creation, access to affordable infrastructure, and socioeconomic advancement. This commitment is something which initially came out of our valuable stakeholder discussion forum, of which ICMA is a member, and which has been warmly welcomed by the market. It also, of course, coincides with the very dramatic growth in the social bond market in the past couple of years. Another innovation was our inclusion of biodiversity as one of the expenditure categories in our framework. And a further innovation was the publication of a pre-issuance impact assessment alongside the second party opinion. This impact assessment, together with our other documents relating to our green financing programme, is available on the UK DMO's website and it assesses the alignment of the framework with the government's overall environmental strategy. And a further really important step which the UK government has taken has been to launch a green retail product, retail green savings bonds, governed by the same 
green financing framework as the green gilt. These retail bonds are being offered through our sister institution, National Savings and Investments, which is, like the UK DMO, an agency of Her Majesty's Treasury, one that provides households with an opportunity to buy various government-backed savings products. And these retail green savings bonds are giving households the opportunity to invest in the government's environmental agenda. There are many more things I could say about this initiative, particularly about the debt management considerations, which we needed to take into account. But one key point to highlight is that it was important for us from the start to ensure that green gilts raise financing for green projects in as smooth and cost effective a way as possible and also in a way which is fully in line with the government's debt management objective, namely to minimise cost over the long term subject to risk. And in order to achieve this, we've considered the Green Gilt programme holistically in the context of our overall debt financing programme, and in particular with a focus on integrating green gilt issuance into the wider gilt program we've done this in various ways but largely through utilizing the same structure and the same process as our standard gilts which remain one of the deepest and most liquid asset classes in the world I think the reception to these offerings demonstrated very visibly the enthusiasm of sterling bond market participants for green assets, as well as the growing maturity of the global sovereign green bond market. As we saw very broad, diverse and extremely high quality investor support for both these transactions. So in conclusion, we're currently only at the beginning of the UK's green financing journey. And ultimately, the size of the programme going forward will be determined by the green projects, the assets underlying the issuance. But these first steps are very important ones, not only for the sterling bond market, but also, I think it's fair to say, for the global ESG market more broadly. So with that, I would like to thank ICMA once again for organizing this valuable and timely conference. And I would like to thank you all for your participation today. Thank you.